Many people recognize behavioral economist and Duke professor Dan Ariely as the author of the amazingly interesting, predictably irrational. He likes to point out that he's also founder of the Center for Advanced Hindsight. We're thrilled to have him here in our studio. Thanks for being here, Dan. My pleasure. All right, so I'll bite. What is the Center for Advanced Hindsight? So often when we describe our results to people, yes, people behave this way and that way, not as you expected. People say, no, 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 I expected it all along. I all along knew that this was the right yeah. behavior. So the Center for Advanced Hindsight is supposed to emphasize the fact that often we think in hindsight that we knew things all along, where in fact it wasn't, it uh, wasn't okay. the case. So it's ironic. It's supposed the, to be the, ironic. The Institute of Monday Morning That's Quarterbacking. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. Dan, why is it so hard to say? If you, in your book, talk about the problems of self-control, if you were um, a policymaker, how would you raise the savings rate in the U.S.? Yeah. So uh, I think the first thing to understand is that there are two problems with, with saving. The first one is what we call intertemporal choice, is that saving is between now and later. And uh, in many cases, we have these dilemmas. Dilemmas are between eating now and being healthy later, exercising now and being healthy later, uh, taking our medication now, which is unpleasant now, but good for later. And in all of those cases, what we do is we focus on the present much more in the future. And that's, and that's one big mistake. And it's an inherent part of human nature that we just don't care about the long term as much. And uh, because of that, it's not going to be helpful just to educate people because we have this bias to focus on something now. If you have a bicycle you're thinking about right now, and I say, would you ride this now? Or would you like to have another thousand dollars when you retire in 30 years, right? That's just not that powerful. Yes. The, the second part of it is that money, interesting, important, useful, and so on, also has some drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks about money is that it's abstract. And because it's abstract, it's very hard to think for us about what it really means. So if I say, would you like a bicycle now? You know what it is. If I say $1,000 more at retirement, what will it buy you? What's the hedonic value? You know, when people talk about difficult decisions, they often say it's like comparing apples to oranges. It turns out comparing apples to oranges is trivial. You don't see anybody baffled by the fruit salad, by the fruit plate saying, oh my goodness, I have no idea which one to pick. But if I say, is an apple right now worth for you 50 cents, 25 cents, a dollar, two dollars, those are hard decisions. You're not really sure how much it's worth. And that's the second part with money, is it's so abstract and so general, we can do so many things with it, that we're not really sure what we're gaining or what we're giving up. That's interesting. Now, uh, some uh, movement in retirement planning right now is to force companies with 401k plans to express them not as lump sums, but as streams of income in the future. Does mm -hmm. that make it easier to grasp what it is? It does make it easier. So in, in one of the surveys we did with ARP uh, a while ago, we found out that people who were really well off with millions of dollars in the bank account were doing kind of crazy stuff to try and save money. They were not going to movies. They were cutting their medis medicine, taking half portions. They were doing little things that were getting them to be miserable to extend their money a little bit just so they would not outlive their money because it's such a frightening thing. And if we gave people annuities, I think it would be much much, much better. Now, the annuity market is a terrible market, but if we had a good annuity market, that would be wonderful. It would be much more compatible with how people can actually think about money and execute their decisions. Because an annuity guarantees that you won't run out and it gives would, you a set amount every month. That's right. And you can plan, right? Here is your amount of money. You can plan. And if you spend more, you know something will have to give up and you can see what it is. Good. All right. Let's move into a different category uh, where behavioral finance might offer us some guidance. Healthcare reform. Big debate. But the very mention of it, uh, of goals that sound like very rational things, like universal insurance and lowering the cost of health care, uh, have triggered this violent gut reaction against government interference. What's going on here? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things. Um, the first thing is I think that we all believe a little bit too much in kind of uh, Milton Friedman's uh, economy. And even though we've gone through this uh, hopefully reforming experience in the stock market, people still believe to a large degree about the wisdom of companies and individuals and so on and, and the free market as an enterprise. For a free market to work, you need people to be able to work as, as agents that are rational, comparing, doing all those things. You can't imagine you feeling pain in your left side and you calling different hospitals and say, what's your rate today for, for a bed? You know, 10 days, can I get a discount if I stay longer? You know, so, so the conditions uh, uh, for a free market actually don't work in healthcare. So that's kind of one, I think, frightening thing. The second is what we call the endowment effect. 
it turns out that when people get used to a particular um, environment, particular goods, uh, they start to think of them as, as the right. Oh. And when you take it away from them, they feel very bad about it. So the recent debate about uh, mammograms, I think, is very much like that. Do women really want mammogram every year? I think if, you, if we didn't have it, and you were presenting to women the cost and benefit, and you say, look, do you want to have mammogram once a year with this amount of radiation, or every two years with less radiation? Uh, do you know that there are many cancers that you would see on mammograms, but in fact would never metastasize, but you would worry about them until you get the biopsy? You, you kind of went through the cost-benefit analysis, I think women would not have it, would not want it. But now that they have it, they look at it as the right, and taking it away looks to many people as, as if it's offensive. Is there, are there uh, tricks that you can use in your own life to make you behave more rationally about money? Um, yes, I, th I think there, there, there are multiple tricks. And the, the, the thing to understand is that there's not one thing that we do wrong, but there are many things that we do wrong. So there's not one trick to do things. But for example, um, if you understand that money is actually very complex, that it's very hard to think about it, uh, maybe what you want to do is something financially inefficient but not compatible with human nature. So for example, if you're considering spending $1,000 on a, on a trip to Hawaii, you might th try to think to yourself, what does this $1,000 mean at retirement? Very hard to think about it. Instead, you could translate it to other things. And you can say, OK, what else could they do with $1,000? And you can say, I could go uh, 10 times to the theater, and I can buy five books, and I could have two meals in this particular restaurant. And now you have two representations that are hedonic, that are emotional, that you can actually try to feel and understand. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when people have these direct trade-offs, they're much more able to, to do them. So, so here's something that you're doing that is irrational. You're taking money which can buy you lots of stuff and you're translating it to one particular version, but it allows you to think about the money more, more concretely. Dan, this is very interesting. Thanks very much. My pleasure. And thanks for watching.